But today we, we turn our study to the conclusion of our series, and I think it comes at a perfect time for us. We're going to look at that final we have promise uh, in our series, but we're doing so as we reflect today, as we prepare for our communion service. You know, we, we are invited by God to, to look and, and evaluate our lives and those, those holes in our lives, those gaps where we, we need to draw closer to God. Uh, certainly, as we've entered into where we are with our walk currently, wherever that is, wherever that is that you currently today stand in your walk with God, it doesn't matter if you're a beginner. It doesn't matter if you're a long timer who's still at the beginning. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, grown in that process. We all have something to reflect upon today, something to work on, something that needs uh, the help of heaven, right? We need the help of heaven. Today serves us as a, as a reminder that uh, we're supposed to be constantly looking at what is next on my list. What is that thing that's next that I, I need God's grace, God's providence, God's help in? What is that next character flaw that I need to submit to God? Where, what am I going to revolt against next? What am I going to, to turn against and go forward against and fight against in my own life? What are those ways in which I need Jesus to battle next in my life? What temptations do you still struggle with? What is that constant nagging temptation that's going on in your life and in my life? Where do we need added strength? I believe... That this is why God gave us food items to help us remember what he has done in the death, in his death. Uh, food items. You know, I'm Italian. I like food. Do you like food? I don't think it's so solely Italians, right? But we love food. We are very passionate about food. We're emotional about food. And, you know, you have a, is there a smell that you catch in a kitchen every once in a while and it, puts you back in time. You remember being a child and, and having mom or dad or grandma and grandpa cook that, that special meal, right? We have, we have an attachment to food. Bread and, and the grape juice, they, they give us strength, physical strength, right? We eat a food for physical strength and then we rely on God to then also give us a spiritual strength through these emblems. Well, not through the emblems, but through what he has done and the emblems serve as a reminder of what he has done. I want to invite you to go back for a second into that upper room process, that last supper. They didn't just, you know, eat a tiny little cracker and sip on grape juice, did they? We do that in remembrance, right? We get a little cup of grape juice and, and this, this tiny little cracker that we eat, right? Or the little piece of bread that we eat. Was that what they were doing? Did they have tiny little emblems there in the upper room? No, they were feasting, they were eating, they were being full, right? And so uh, we'll, we'll do that uh, with our agape feast coming up where you have more you know, food that you celebrate with. But here they were, they were eating and drinking with Jesus to provide strength for their bodies. It wasn't a little snack, they were eating. And so today, though we have these little emblems that help us remember we are seeking that God will fill us with his strength and power and his, and his righteousness. Amen? Amen? So we don't just come to get a little bit from Jesus. We are coming today to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. We don't need just a nibble or a sip of his righteousness. We need to gulp it. We need to chew on it, digest it. We need a lot of it. I know I need a lot of it today. I want to read this uh, powerful paragraph to you. This is from the book, Desire of Ages. It's page 466. And it's going to start off with something that's kind of shocking, I believe. Notice what it says here. It says, in the work of redemption, there is no compulsion. Now, that's not shocking. No external force is employed. In other words, God does not force himself on you. He does not make you serve him, right? No external force is implied. We are not compelled to do uh, or to accept him. 
But here's what might be shocking. She says, the expulsion of sin is the act of the soul, your life itself. The expulsion of sin is the act of you yourself. You want to get rid of sin in your life? You have to expel the sin in your life. I have to expel the sin in my life. Now, don't worry. I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking it too. I've got more to read. We've got good news coming. But you ha we have to hear that. That is so key. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. Let's keep reading. It is true. We have no power. How much power? None. No power to free ourselves from Satan's control. However, when we desire to be set free from sin, and so first part is desire, second part, and in our great need, cry out for a power above ourselves. The powers of the soul are imbued now, I wasn't smart enough to know what imbued meant. I had to look it up. I won't ask you if, if you know what that means. But I like the word saturated. Saturated. The powers of the soul are saturated with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit. And they, the powers of the life, our senses, our emotions, our, you know, our thoughts, they obey the dictates of the will in fulfilling the will of God. I don't want to just have a little bit today. Let it be known here from the preacher up front. I don't want to nibble and sip a little bit of the righteousness of Christ. I want to be saturated in the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope and I pray that is your desire today as well. Amen. To be saturated with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit. Are you coming today to the communion service desiring saturation? To be filled in fact, saturation almost sound, doesn't to you sound like it's more than being filled, right? You know, you pick up a saturated sponge or a rag, what does it do? It drips, right? I want to over, be, be overfilled with the divine energy of God. But the key there was in, that mid, in the middle part, when we desire to be set free. This has been the, the theme of our revolutionary war. We have these promises discussion. It is not about deservedness. You and I do not deserve to be saturated with divine energy. We need to desire to be saturated with divine energy. If you desire today, I didn't say if you deserve today. I said if you desire today to be saturated with the Holy Spirit, you will be saturated. You will overflow with the Holy Spirit if you desire. See, as we've been discussing the Revolutionary War, I hope you have received the main point of studying that powerful historical story. The Americans were not strong enough to win. They were not capable enough to find victory. They were not smart enough to win. They didn't have the larger army. They didn't have the tools it took to win, but they desired to win. Stronger than life itself, they desired to win. 
We learned that God held a strong providence over the continental army. Yes? Did we learn that? He had a strong providence over them. Think about that battle of Long Island we talked about and that, that dense fog that rolled in just as the boats arrived, right? On the East River. I mean, it's powerful. God held strong providence over them. But he did not simply do it because they deserved it. He did it because they desired it. They desired a country of freedom. And we know those Bill of Rights. We know the first one. We know where it, all the foundation for our freedoms lie. The foundation is freedom of religion, right? To choose to walk with God. God will not force us into submission, but they wanted to build a country where we could freely choose to follow Jesus. They wouldn't quit. They couldn't quit. They were too passionate about the fight. So they kept fighting through disease, through brutal defeats, through retreats, through winters. They kept pressing forward. They kept the goal in mind. They kept coming back. They kept coming back. They kept coming back. This is why we gather in church on Sabbath. We keep coming back for more divine energy, to be encouraged, to be reminded of the battle ahead, to feel that experience and that joint experience that we have together as family to fight the agencies of darkness. We keep coming back to say, yes, Lord, saturate my life, overfill my life with divine energy. I think, though, that it's simple it's easy for our pride. It's simple. It's easy for us to state, I don't deserve it. You know why it's easy for us to admit that? Because there's no one in the room who does deserve it. And so it's human. It's natural. It's not a sign that I'm humble if I say, I, I, I need help from God. It's not, right? Right? It's no different. It doesn't separate me from the crowd. It doesn't separate you from the crowd to say, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. It puts you in the same boat as everyone else. It is measurable. It is tangible. We can read it in scripture. You know, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? So it's not special or humbling for us to say, I need help. I think sometimes we hide from the real truth. And the real truth, the real question we should be asking ourselves is, do I desire, do I really desire to be saturated with God? Because that we can fake. That we can come to church and pretend that we desire. We can stand up straightest as we sing. We can, we can put money in the, the offering you know, plate, the bag as it goes around. We can sit up and, and listen as, as the pastor is preaching. We can turn in the scriptures and everyone can see that we are here, but the desire is internal. We can fake our way through that. We can't fake our way through righteousness. Everyone knows we're not righteous enough. But we can fake our way through our desire for righteousness. So as we participate in the communion service, I don't want you to think about the reasons you don't deserve. I want you to ask yourself what you really, truly desire. Am I desiring God in my life? Am I desiring righteousness in my life? Am I desiring to be changed and molded by the great potter in my life? We know, we know that we cannot desire enough, but I want to remind you of what the Father said um, uh, in Mark 9 that we've been discussing the last few weeks. Lord, he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Well, I want uh, to, us to change the words a little bit today. Lord, I desire. Help me desire more. Amen. I do desire, but I don't desire enough. I hope and pray you desire at least a little but you know what? Let's be honest. You don't desire enough. 
Lord, I don't desire. I mean, I desire, but I don't desire enough. Change me, Lord. Help me desire more. I want to be saturated. Only you and the Lord know if you truly desire. The pastor cannot judge that for you. The people next to you cannot cannot measure that for you. Only you and the Lord know the truth if you really, truly desire his blessings and his care and his power. You can't hide the truth from him. So let him speak to you today and be honest with him today. Lord, it is true, I desire, but help me desire more. When the Revolutionary War began, how many colonies set out to free themselves of the, the British crown? 13, right? Can you name them all? No, that's all right, if you can. But 13 colonies set out and said, we want to be free of the British crown. And yet, eight years later, as the Treaty of Paris is signed in 1783, uh, the British crown did not make peace with the United States of America. It made peace individually with each colony. It made peace with Virginia. It made peace with New York. It made peace with South Carolina. It made peace with each individual colony. But here's what's really cool about it. We may think that that's all that we achieved or acquired at the, at the Treaty of Paris. But the 13 colonies said, nah, -uh. we don't just want these 13 colonies free. And we were actually given land all the way to the Mississippi River in the Treaty of Paris. You see, when they started the battle, they desired freedom for the 13 colonies. But as the battle raged, they desired more. So that by the end of it, they didn't just get the freedom for the 13 colonies, but all that territory to the Mississippi River. Many times this is our spiritual life. We start out on the path and we say, Lord, here's where I need strength. Here's the one thing I really need to get rid of in my life. Here's the one thing that I need change in. But don't settle for that one thing. Each day, each year, desire more. Desire more and desire more. Desire more. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. God will not do the work for you without you first stating, Lord, I desire. Help me desire more. You must ask for it. You must desire it. You must be willing to accept it. And if you desire it, you will be saturated with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you will be saturated with victory. Not just over that one sin, but over the second sin and the third thing, and the fourth flaw, and the fifth weakness, and the seventh one, the tenth one, the twelfth one, the hundredth one, however many it is, keep pressing forward and let God give you his divine energy to have victory over all of them through Jesus Christ. Let's catch an important formula here. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. This is uh, Paul's letter to his young disciple, Timothy, a young man, a teenager, likely a teenager. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to, first we're going to read verse 13 and 14, discuss that a bit, and then we'll have a third verse here in 1 Timothy 1, so don't close your Bibles yet. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14. Here's what it says in verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> Here, a few more pages turning. No rush. That's great. It says here, verse 13, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, 
But, oh, that's good news. That's good news, isn't it? That the sentence continues. I was the, you know, he's going to say, I'm the chief sinner here. But, but, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in my unbelief. He did all this bad stuff, including chasing men, women, and children out of their homes for persecution. But what? I continue. Obtained what? Mercy. Did you hear that? Are you claiming that? Are you desiring that here and now? Do you want to be saturated with mercy? But I obtained mercy. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Was it abundant? Nope. Sorry, trick question. The grace of God was not abundant. It was what? Exceedingly abundant. Wow. Paul saying, I was in my sin, but I obtained mercy. And then I, things were abundant. He helped me. He, I obtained it. But then he says, and then it was exceedingly abundant. Exceedingly abundant. It's not just abundant to the sinner. Remember, he's saying, I was a sinner. I was the chief. I was persecuting the children of God. But I obtained mercy and grace was exceedingly abundant. Let me ask you today, everyone, is that only for Paul? It's not only for the Apostle Paul or Paul Dosti. It's not just for them. It's not just for guys named Paul. It's for Kathy, Lovemore, Pussy, Linda, and all the way around each of us. That promise is for each of us. Amen. Exceedingly abundant. It's for you Amen. and for me. Let's notice verse 18, same chapter, 1 Timothy 1, verse 18. With what he just said, he says, This charge, what I just said, I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophe prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them, by what we just learned, by them you may wage the good warfare. Does Paul want you and I to wage warfare? No. Trick question again. Not just warfare. What? Good warfare. He wants us to wage good warfare. Godly warfare. He wants us to fight with God by our side and say, Lord, I desire. Help me desire more. I need victory over this. Help me want victory over all of these things. So I charge you the way Paul charged Timothy. Fight the good warfare. And you will find exceedingly abundant victory. Amen? Amen. If you desire, you will find. You will not find the key to live but the key to abundantly live. You will not just have joy, but abundant joy. You won't just receive mercy, but exceedingly abundant mercy and grace in time of need. And you may be thinking, but I can't do that. Let me be clear and loving to you, but clear. Stop thinking that way. It's such a waste of time. We know you can't do that. I know I can't do that. But he can. He can and he will. He promises not just to do it, but to abundantly do it. 
exceedingly abundantly to do it in your life. Here's another powerful paragraph. Desire of Ages 329. Speaking of Jesus, it says, the elder brother of our race, that's Jesus. The elder brother of our race is by the eternal throne. Where's he at? By the eternal throne. He's right there by the Father. He looks upon every soul who is turning their face toward him as the Savior. Who does he look at? Everyone who wants his, his attention. Do you desire his attention? He's looking at you. Do you turn to him as your Savior? He's looking upon you. It's amazing. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity. What are, what are our wants and where lies the strength of our temptations? For he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without what? Sin. He knows what you're going through. He knows the struggle. He already knows you can't do it alone. He knows it. He experienced it, yet he experienced it with exceeding and abundant mercy. He made it through without sin. He knows how to do it. He's done it. He is watching over you, O trembling child of God. It doesn't say perfect child of God. Trembling child of God. You know your weaknesses. You know your failures. You know. And he's looking upon you, O trembling child of God. And then she says this, and I love this. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. I'm going to read just that section again. He is watching over you, O oh, trembling child of God. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. Wow. He will. He will. He will. Your condition is what it is. It is what it is. But in your condition, He will. He will strengthen. He will hear. He will help. He will heal. He will. So let's take that then to our final we have promise. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. There's a we have here in Revelation. Revelation chapter 7. Give me just a few more moments and then we will go to our communion. Revelation chapter 7. Starting at verse 1, I want you to catch the context here as we go into reading it. All the other we haves have been us based. In other words, it's we have. Things that we have. But here in our final one, we are going to notice a we have that is actually heaven's work. Heaven also has. Notice this. Revelation 1 I'm sorry, uh, chapter 7, then starting at verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, the sea, or on the tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying... Here we go, verse 3. Do not hurt, harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. Until what? Until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. It's interesting that it calls these angels the ones who harm the earth. 
But I want you to know that they're not the ones who harm the earth. They're actually the ones protecting the earth. The way that they become the ones who harm the earth is that they stop protecting the earth, right? That after the sealing is done, they stop the protection. Sin is what harms us. Sin is the winds of strife in our lives. God is not the cause of the pain and the misery in our lives. Sin is. But these angels will not be told to let the winds blow on the earth, to saturate the world in its sin that it chooses, until what? We have sealed the servants of God. Heaven has a we have. Heaven has a desire. Heaven has a goal. What is it? They say, we have sealed the servants of God. Heaven desires to seal you, to protect you now and for eternity. Heaven has a desire. In fact, it's why heaven is holding back the winds of strife. The reason it's holding back the final persecution, the final outpouring of sin, is that heaven is waiting to seal you with the seal of God. Amen. Heaven desires you. Yes. Amen. Do you desire heaven? Yes. Do you desire to be sealed? Yes. Do you desire to be found safe and secure in the love of God. Do you desire this morning to live exceedingly and abundantly in the grace of God? Because according to this prophecy, if you do desire, you will be sealed eternally in Jesus Christ.